Yep. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for attending. Um, yeah, so today's session, we'll be talking about uh, managing bills of material uh, with Vault PLM. So on the agenda, we have um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Vault, the Vault side of the equation, and how you can take your uh, bombs straight from your CAD environment into uh, Vault Professional to arrive at a complete engineering bill of materials. Um, we'll talk then more into moving and sharing the bomb across the organization. Um, and then when we get into the PLM side of things in Fusion Lifecycle, we'll look at comparing bills of material in that environment, um, how you can incorporate uh, people outside your company, even in your processes, and then talk a little bit about how you might uh, release that bill of materials out to uh, the rest of the company. Uh, for example, to manufacturing, purchasing, et cetera. So we've got a lot to cover this morning. Uh, the session will be running uh, 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. And as a reminder, this is now the third in a series of five webcasts. Our first was an introduction, so it's not on this slide, but um, today is February 24th, depending on where you are. And we're talking about, again, using PLM, uh, Vault PLM to manage bills of material. Uh, next week, at the same time, we'll be talking about using PLM to manage new product introduction. Um, and we'll be finishing up uh, the week after on March 10th with using Vault PLM to manage supplier information. All right, so let's get started. Um, so most of us here, I think, know what a bomb is, bill of materials, but just, uh, you know, as a jumping off point, let's just kind of discuss, you know, what I call a bill of materials. They're actually, depending on how you do things, maybe a lot of different types of bill of materials in your environment. Um, but there's a lot of information that goes into how to make a product. Um, part of it is certainly a list of components, um, but there's a, just a lot more to that bill of materials than just um, what's there. It's really a recipe. It's not just what's there, but how it goes together, um, what expected outcomes should be, like inspection, things like that. So there's a lot that goes into really defining a product, and the bomb really is the core of that. Um, and a lot of different tools go in to building that bill of materials. Um, and that bill of materials is not a thing that gets done, especially like at the beginning of the process, and then that's it, right? That bomb is really a living thing and it spans the entire life cycle. Typically we'll start, you know, in R&D or in engineering and it, um, you know, gets flushed out from a standpoint of what goes into the product. Um, and then from there, it gets transformed and added to, and through that whole process, it's changing, right? So managing bills of material can actually be a very complex uh, part of the product design and manufacture process. Um, and that's borne out with research that Autodesk has done, you know, in asking companies, what challenges do you face uh, from day to day? Um, last week, we talked about managing change, um, which is pretty much the most, uh, the biggest challenge that most companies face. Um, real close to that, though, is configurations and bills of material, right? Um, and change really impacts everything else. Uh, so it's understandable that, that that would be a big challenge, but bombs are pretty close second because communicating bombs and doing so accurately, um, making them useful, um, there are a lot of challenges. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is one way that you can help uh, streamline those processes uh, to make creating those bills of material and maintaining them and managing them uh, easier. Um, so we're going to spend a lot of time in software today just to show you kind of what that process would and could look like. Um, but I'd like to start, before we get into things, um, with a question for you all. Because 
there are lots of different ways that people uh, create and maintain their bill of materials. So we've got a question here to start out with. Uh, basically, where is your engineering bill of materials store? So this is be the, the bill of materials that you know uh, a CAD user would have input on, engineering would have input on, and that is often the starting point for what the rest of the business would use. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the poll up here. Um, and again, the idea is I'd like to understand what you would consider your official engineering bill of materials. Um, a lot of people put it into a spreadsheet, like they have Excel or maybe a Google Doc or, you know, uh, real old school, maybe Lotus 123 or Lotus Notes, that sort of suite. Not many people using that today, but if you could take just a second and, and provide a little feedback, because I'm curious where the audience stands. Um, again, spreadsheets are, in my mind, probably the, one of the most common. Um, it could be in the CAD model. And I guess to clarify this, um, where would you consider the bomb is complete? Um, so CAD model would be, are, would your inventor bill of materials, or if you use inventor or AutoCAD mechanical structure, which is rare, but out there, um, or in AutoCAD electrical, do you have uh, information stored on the symbols. So is it considered your actual CAD model, the the source, the where your bomb is completely accurate? Um, or maybe it's on a drawing, like maybe you put a parts list on a drawing and you add rows to that parts list in an inventor drawing to get to your complete bill of materials. Um, so, and then finally, you know, a lot of our customers have, you know, systems like um, ERP or, or MRP. And yes, that's where I would consider like the, the manufacturing bomb um, or like an execution type bomb to live. Um, but other companies will have a, maybe a homegrown system where they keep track of everything like in a Microsoft Access environment or something. Okay, so we've given you a couple minutes now. Um, I think we've got all the votes in that we're gonna have. And um, and I think that makes sense what I see. Um, the majority of you actually picked another system. And I think my question might've been a little confusing um, because yes, eventually it goes into an ERP system somewhere. Um, but a very close second there was spreadsheets <laughs> as I expected. Um, and it's, um, I've heard it said more than once that um, Microsoft Excel is the biggest PLM system in the world. Um, it's the biggest lots of, you know, insert system X here, just because it's so ubiquitous. Um, it's relatively easy to use. Most people can at least muddle their way through it, if not use it pretty well. Um, so Excel does a lot for a lot of people, um, but there are inherent issues with that. Um, it's a file typically sitting on a network folder somewhere or maybe these days in, in cloud storage like SharePoint or something. But if you're doing something like managing a bill of materials, um, you're talking about a lot of manual manipulation of things. Um, it can be very difficult to connect Excel to other business systems, for example, to get real time, you know, information at your fingertips for some of this information. And so it tends to be a very manual process, a very error prone process. Um, a fair number of you also said that um, maybe even down onto the drawing itself, um, where you might again take an inventor bill of materials and manipulate uh, the parts list itself. And in my mind, that's even more difficult to manage because now it's in a file that most of your company probably can't even open, <laughs> um, let alone manipulate. Um, and so that tends to lead to passing that drawing off to um, somebody either in electronic form or even worse on paper. And then they're typing that information back into some other business system. 
to essentially duplicate that bill of materials that someone spent a lot of time working on, um, pretty much start over and type it all back in. And every time, every keystroke is an opportunity for a mistake, right? So um, thank you for that feedback. I really appreciate it. It is about what I expected based on you know conversations I've had with lots of different companies. Um, so let's talk very specifically now about our engineering bill of materials. Um, you know, if you're using something like Inventor, um, the idea really should be that we're capturing uh, our intent for the design, right? So when we started in AutoCAD decades ago, um, transitioning from a board with paper, um, AutoCAD was essentially just a digital drafting board, right? It was just a way to put lines down um, in a much more effective way. Um, and as CAD software has evolved over the decades, um, it's really given us an opportunity to communicate our intent to the computer so that it becomes easier to make changes to things, like if you're doing parametric design. Um, but part of that intent really should be what's required to actually put this whole thing together. So not just what does it look like, but the full picture of what makes that up, right? And if we're talking about a product, increasingly these days, products are electromechanical. Um, and so you've got a mechanical model, you have you know electrical like control systems or PCBs. Um, you know, again, there's a lot that goes into the full design of our product, um, the more the authors of that data can communicate their intent, the better that intent is going to get communicated throughout the rest of the business. Um, right? And that one way that communication can happen is through something like Autodesk Vault or Vault PLM as a more complete solution. Um, and again, starting with the engineering bomb, that really is a, a functional uh, description of the product. Here's what makes it up. Here are the rules for actually making this thing. Um, now, the execution side of it is what you would, you know, often maybe call like a manufacturing bomb, um, where you start to get into um, things like routings and extra bits of you know uh, things you have to buy to in order to execute things like packing tape and shipping materials you know all the rest of the stuff to execute the build and delivery you know that still needs to be accounted for so right now we're just talking about the engineering bomb um, and one way you can do that is through the use of Autodesk vault so let's take a quick look here at um, some just vocabulary stuff to get started. So we've got Autodesk Vault we're talking about now. Um, and the way bills of material would be managed in Autodesk Vault is through something called uh, an item. Now this may be review for some of you that are using Vault and Vault items today. Um, but for those of you that aren't familiar with it, an item is essentially just a bucket. Um, I think of an item in Vault as just a part number. Um, and its primary descriptor is a number, and that number has to be unique in the system. Now, associated with that number can be a lot of other information. Metadata, uh, first and foremost, things like a title, a description, a uh, unit of measure, um, material that it's made of, any information about that part number that is relevant to engineering, and especially that is owned or comes from engineering is the kind of information you'd store in a Vault item. But in addition to that metadata, we've got documents. Vault is a data management system. It manages documents. And so um, that item could be fully described by a Word document or a PDF. Let's say it's a, it's a, a chemical or a lubricant or a sealant. Um, maybe there's a document like an MSDS sheet or a spec sheet that fully describes what that thing is. Um, in Vault, you can link the item to that document that fully describes it. 
um, you could attach other bits of information to it, like a picture of what the packaging looks like, for example, so that if someone wants to make absolutely sure, you know, I'm about to use this thing in a, in a, um, on the floor when I'm building it, what does the package look like? You could have a picture of the package so that there's no question about, you know, what they're grabbing. Um, but if we're talking about the Autodesk world and vaults, very often the definition of that part number really comes from a CAD model. So an IPT or an IAM um, or a DWG file, right? Um, so that, um, that information um, can be captured on the bill of materials in an item record um, so that you have a direct link to your CAD model but also information that engineering or CAD users have described associated with the CAD model can actually um, be captured on that part number automatically in the vault. And then you can always attach to it things like our neutral formats, like a, a PDF or a DWF file. So that item really is a, a bucket or a container. Um, so properties, supporting documentation, um, you know, all of it can be associated on one record for for ease of use and centralized, you know, bucket of information. Right. So at a high level, what we're talking about, um, you communicate your design intent to the software. You check that data into Vault. All the related files are going in there. Um, and then we generate an item record in Vault to represent that thing's part number. And that really is designed to facilitate communication of that bill of materials information um, to the rest of the organization. And the great thing about Vault Pro is that it's very capable from a standpoint of generating these bills of material. It understands a frame generator, tube and pipe, cable and harness, you know, environments and inventor, virtual components, um, it understands AutoCAD electrical bombs, mechanical bombs if you're using structure, and even SOLIDWORKS and CREO files. We can extract bills of material data from those as well. Um, so it is pretty comprehensive in terms of, you know, um, a wide range of design products that are in use today. Um, so that screen capture is wrong. Uh, ideally, you would want to see Vault on the laptop there. So we're going to actually switch over and take a look at Vault right now, both Vault and Inventor. Um, and we're going to go through this a little bit quickly. Um, we are recording this, and you'll get a link to the recording after. So if you'd like to review it in a little more detail, you can always look at the recording after. Um, we'll also um, be more than happy to talk to you if you've got any questions. We can talk to you one-on-one -on -one, um, more about what Vault Pro can do um, how items behave, how they interact with an inventor, et cetera. Right, so I have it uh, up here right now on the screen, um, an Autodesk Inventor model. Uh, it's a relatively simple assembly. Uh, we've got a drawing of it somewhere in the system too. And I just wanted to take a, a, a chance here to talk about bills of material in the context of Inventor. Now about 20% uh, of you said that your bill of materials is essentially fully defined in your CAD model. So this is what I would mean by that. Um, I've got what I consider mostly my complete bill of materials inside Inventor. So, uh, you know, I've got model components. Notice I have a bolted connection here from the uh, design accelerators in Inventor. Um, and if I look at my structured bill of materials, that bolted connection assembly is what we call phantom, um, meaning I don't want it to appear on a bill of materials anywhere. And so the two fasteners that make up that bolted connection actually get promoted to the level of their parent when we look at what I would call the structured bomb, what we call the structured bomb in, vault, in Inventor. Um, and this is essentially the bill of materials for this subassembly. Now there may be some other components we need to add to this, um, but that it doesn't make sense to draw. Now one way we could do that is by creating virtual components inside of Inventor. We could have empty parts or assemblies we add in. Um, both of those can be problematic because it could be difficult to find an empty part somewhere. You might have to go to Vault and search for things and add it to your model, and now you've got an empty piece in there. Um, can confuse somebody looking at it later. Um, if it's a virtual component, um, you have to maybe type in description and part number information 
every time you use it. Um, so to avoid that sort of thing, if we take a look at this same assembly in our vault, we can use Vault Professional to extract the inventor bill of materials into an item record. So this extracted the, the description of the assembly. Um, it links automatically to the assembly and drawing file that's in the system. Um, and it extracted the bill of materials already um, from that assembly. And each of those subcomponents also needs to be an item record in the system. And if you notice in this column over here, I have some interesting little icons with a plus sign. Um, it's actually gonna create new part number records for everything that needs to be new. Um, these two fasteners are already in the system, they're already released, and so it's just gonna re-reference those things. So this is a great way to keep you know, track of part numbers, make sure things are reused properly. Um, and in addition to this automatic extraction, I can do other things, like I could add an attachment to this. So let's say that I have a, a PDF that I created of the drawing, because I wanna make it easy to share with people. I can actually add that PDF to this record. So if somebody comes across this record in the vault system, um, they could see that PDF straight away um, and maybe even preview the drawing right here inside the vault client. So if you've got non-CAD users that still need to interact with vault, this is a great way for them to see that information. And we can even, you know, with some third-party tools on these items, even automate the creation of that PDF so that when you release an item, for example, how we're about to do in just a second, um, that PDF can get generated automatically. So in addition to just capturing this information, adding attachments, I can also add from existing items in the vault or create new on the fly, other components. So if I need some lubricant here, I can actually search for that. It's already in the vault, it already has its part number, it's already released. I could adjust its quantity, I know I need three of these in this case. And now my item is complete, right? I've completed its bill of materials, I've associated uh, additional reference information to it. And now just like, um, you know, if you're used to files in vaults and rev control, our part numbers in Vault have that same behavior um, so that I could change its state and even release this guy. Right. Um, so Vault Pro can give you complete control over your bill of materials, right? I'm gonna get all of these released. Um, and this really has prepared the bill of materials, the engineering bomb, for communication to other parts of the company. Right? Um, we can compare bombs inside Vault Pro. I don't want to get too much into that because we're a bit short on time today. Um, but you can compare bills of material. Um, we have rev control. We can revise these things. Um, we can export a bill of materials from Vault if you need to. Right? But this lets you get complete control over your bomb. Um, and this is really the first part of bomb management in the Vault PLM environment. Right. So just to review the Vault engineering bomb, it gets derived from CAD, Inventor, AutoCAD Electrical, even SolidWorks or Creo. It is integrated with CAD. CAD still controls the part of the bomb that was derived from the model, right? So the engineer, the CAD user who's defining this stuff in the CAD model, they always control that part of it right? Um, it lets you release and publish that bill of materials more effectively um, and helps you manage change on the engineering side. So again, that's the first part. Now, the next part is communicating that bomb to everybody else when it gets transformed and viewed in different ways. And so one more quick poll question here, and we won't have, I won't spend too much time on this, but how do you communicate your bill of materials outside of engineering? Right, and a few different ways. Um, via the drawing, maybe you send a drawing to someone and they look at the parts list or the, the table on the drawing for that information, or via a spreadsheet if you're, if Excel is where your bomb lives, like you know about a third of you said earlier, 
Maybe you just send that spreadsheet when it's done, you email it to somebody or it lives in a network folder. Um, some of you may be exporting that bill of materials um, directly from Inventor, say to a CSV file or even Excel file, but Inventor is where it's complete and then you export it. Um, others, you know, and I say this is relatively rare in most cases, I think, a direct integration with ERP or MRP where you may be taking that CAD bomb and have something like um, CAD link is a really common one where you can have an add-in inside Inventor and you can compare a bomb directly to an ERP system and, and push the bomb. Right. Um, so about half of you have voted. Um, and as I expected, actually I'm a little bit surprised. Um, I thought spreadsheets would be more common, but um, a really common method here is, is actually sharing it via a drawing. So actually the, the most common method here is you just pass off a drawing to somebody. Um, so I really appreciate uh, your responses to that. Um, and I would say, obviously we're not alone. A lot of you do that. And I would say that's generally the least efficient way to pass off this bill of materials. Cause again, that often leads to retyping information into another system, right? So let's talk about a better way of doing that. Um, and that's where the entire vault PLM platform comes into, comes into play. So where we start with the bomb, the engineering bomb defined in PDM, largely driven by CAD, but then maybe stepped on a little bit inside Vault. Um, it might then go into Fusion Lifecycle, right? So we take that product data, we can add better processes on top of it, invite and involve more people into the process, and really streamline the communication and really overall management of that bill of materials um, to get everybody involved, right? so that everybody's always on the same page. Um, one central location to go for um, what is considered the complete enterprise bill of materials. Um, engineering could still own the engineering bomb that comes from Vault, um, but the complete picture is in PLM. Um, really effectively putting time against the bomb, change is a constant, <laughs> right? And so, um, we really do often need to know what did a bomb look like, maybe even on a certain day, right? PLM lets us more easily put that time element against the bomb because it's better at managing change. And so we can go back in time and see exactly when, what did the bomb look like on this day? And then being able to compare that, those changes in bills of material. What did it look like uh, three months ago versus what does it look like today what changed right um so in addition to those basic ideas you know we have lots of capabilities when we're looking at bills of material in fusion life cycle um, the biggest one is different views for different use cases we have views for bombs in invent in vault but that's really we have more of a, a unified use case for bombs in vault that really is mostly the CAD users in engineering. The bomb infusion life cycle is used by everybody, even pe potentially people outside of your company, if you want to get them involved in your processes, which you can do with fusion life cycle. So being able to control what people see and how they see it is integral to this process and fusion life cycle can do that. Um, when we're looking at bombs, we're often looking at purchase components Fusion Lifecycle can help you maintain a list of manufacturers and vendors. Now, yes, that's often owned by ERP, right? Who you buy things from and what they cost, that really is an execution thing that's an ERP, but engineering often needs insight into that, especially if they're being asked to vet what should be a functional equivalent from a different supplier. They may need to be able to weigh in on that, really make sure that what procurement found a great deal on for a new supplier, does that really fit into the design? PLM can be the bridge between Vault and ERP so that everyone's looking at the same set of information, the process, 
everyone participates in the same process and so everyone is aware and informed um, and there's one place to go to make those decisions and and make sure that it all gets done right um, comparing the bill of materials of course and then extending that information elsewhere throughout the organization um, again maybe integration directly with the ERP um, so not a handoff of a drawing but when we release something in Fusion Lifecycle, it could automatically update ERP so that the bomb that it needs to maintain for execution can be updated automatically and vice versa so that we have, again, PLM is the glue. I've talked about this in prior, uh, in prior sessions. PLM is the glue that kind of holds all this stuff together. So let's take um, uh, a criminally brief <laughs> look at PLM. Um, it is a bit of a complex topic, um, and I don't want to scare you too much. Um, but one thing I see that has happened is um, when I released that bomb in Vault, um, I have a job running behind the scenes um, that actually transfers that bill of materials up to Fusion Lifecycle. Um, and that looks like it. I'm looking at it run right now, it's almost done. And so we could take a look here inside uh, Fusion Lifecycle. Um, and if we look at, I've got a special workspace. We talked a little bit last week about workspaces, um, but um, if we take a look at our Vault Bombs workspace, these are bills of material that got transferred directly from Vault to Fusion Lifecycle without any intervention from me, right? And so I think now this just finished up, um, we were looking at a combustion chamber. And so if I refresh my view here, um, we should see here um, my combustion chamber parts are now inside my system here. Um, so that bill of materials from Vault actually did get added up. And I think it's this guy here, I forgot to give him a description. Um, but this is my combustion chamber. Um, you know, this is one of my components here. Um, my parts got added up, their descriptions got added up, and now this is where we're ready for the rest of the process to take over, um, right? Um, now, they start out unreleased, right? Because while their engineering bomb is released, this, you might call it the manufacturing bomb, that's a very complex term. So I don't want to say this is, you know, you know, would necessarily be what you would execute against, but this is where additional information gets added. And so there's additional things to fill out. For example, um, if this is a purchased component, um, we may need to come in here and say where we buy it, right? So this is where Fusion Lifecycle could come in and say, um, okay, we might buy this from uh, a certain supplier. And I've got a list of suppliers here that are maintained in Fusion Lifecycle. Um, right, and these suppliers, we'll talk more about this um, in a couple weeks, um, we could have workflows inside PLM where we regularly audit these suppliers to make sure that what they sell us is what they promised, right? That workflow could be managed by Fusion Lifecycle, and because we're doing that in Fusion Lifecycle, we could take advantage of that information. Here's everyone that we've said is allowed to provide products to us, you know, here's, you know, their part number, um, what it costs us from them, right? Um, and we could have a whole list of suppliers here, um, potentially, right? Now, I want to take a look at a slightly more complex workspace to show you some more workflows here. Um, so if I go back home, I've got a, a component here that I've already linked. Um, let's see here this guy here. So this is a, a slightly more complex component um, in a slightly different workspace. And we can see its bill of materials here. Um, and this is a, um, in this case, it's a, a nested bomb. We have multiple levels here and we can expand that out. Um, this is a, a, an electrical component. Um, but we'll look at, we can look at these bombs in different ways. So this is a, a, a multi-level bomb. We can flatten this if we need to. Um, notice something interesting here. We've got a column of information, this reference designator. 
this is actually capturing information for device descriptions or tags or, or device tags on the schematic representation of this thing, right? So we can get very specific with the information about these components on this specific bill of materials, right? Now, if we go and look at a drill down here to one of these guys, um, this one here, I think, is the one we want to look at. Um, we've got an extensive list of components here, again. And we can look at these bombs in different ways, right? So this is my default view I have going right now. Um, I could look at um, for environmental compliance, um, right? A whole different set of columns would, will appear right? Is it Rojas compliant? Is it REACH compliant? Does it meet our conflict mineral um, compliance standards? Um, so depending on your role, you may or may not be able to see some of this information, um, you know, and you may or may not be able to edit certain information about the component. Right. Now, if we take a look at one of these components specifically, notice I'm logged in as a certain user here in the system. I can see certain information in here, including information about, you know, who we're allowed to buy it from. Now, you can get third parties involved into this process outside your organization, but you certainly don't want a supplier to maybe see other suppliers that you might buy from and what those costs are. That actually would be a very bad thing. So if I take a look at, and I'm going to call up the same component in Microsoft, in uh, Edge here as a different user, this is the same, this is the same component in two different views. This is on the right here is me logged in as an administrator of the system. This is me logged in as maybe a supplier. Um, and this, as a supplier, I can even edit this, but notice I cannot see who, you know, me as my customer might buy this from. All I can do is maybe say, yes, when we supply this component to you, it is Rojas compliant, right? So you can very carefully control who's allowed to see and who's allowed to edit every single one of these properties you might have on a parts part number uh, details page. Um, so if we come back here and take a look, if I edit this, um, we might see, again, our list of approved manufacturers. And I could manipulate this to add a new manufacturer. We can indicate who is our an approved manufacturer versus a preferred manufacturer versus somebody that we shouldn't be using, right? Um, we have that capability. Um, and all of this is cu customizable. You could take advantage of this. You could choose not to. That's always completely up to you, right? Um, So whether or not we fill out this information, um, ultimately, um, you know, what I could do is come in here and say, here's the part number, and here's the, you know, again, another supplier, just kind of like I did in another view. Um, and maybe this is our preferred supplier, right, because they're a little bit cheaper. Right. Now, that kind of information can ultimately roll up to our overall bill of materials, right? So you can see here now, this bill of materials the cost of each component can be over here on the right and can roll up to a complete cost, like if we're looking at the supply chain view, right? Um, so again, the views are, are really important for sharing information to make sure people see things the right way, right? Um, now, in addition, things like effectivity or comparing bills of material. If we look down here, there's a column in here. It looks like a little stamp, you'll see. Um, as I look through here, a couple of these components actually have a stamp, and this means they're undergoing change right now, right? So if I were to click on this link, I can actually go right to the change order that is currently governing this component, right? And if this is our component, component, I can preview that guy. I can see here's the information about it. I get a quick link to edit this. And maybe the change we need to make, it's still pending, right? We need to change the description of this because this isn't actually, um, this is actually, well, 
that's kind of odd that maybe this change has already been done, right? Because this is um, a, a three amp bead, but the bill of materials over here said two amps. So I wonder what's going on. Well, this is today's view using our released revisions. This is what's effective in production today. Um, I can compare that to any pending changes for any of the subcomponents with literally three clicks. And now what I can do is look down through here and see, oh, here's what's going on. This is currently in production. My updates are still pending. They've not been released yet. So I can see, you know, as of today, pending changes, right? Anything that is currently undergoing change will be marked up, right? So this gives me very accurate, literally up to the second uh, information about not only what's going on right now, but what we're planning to happen. And I can compare this as well to something in the past too. Um, I can say, you know, when, you know, you know, at what point in time should we be looking at this um, and make sure that I have the exact information um, that I need at the time. And then finally, let's take one more, one more thing to talk about. And again, I said this was going to be a very short overview. Um, it really, you know, needs more time, but it's a complex topic. And so what we like to do is really, you know, engage with, with companies one-on-one -on -one to get a better sense of your bomb needs and, and you know, illustrate um, what it is that you need. Um, but ultimately, the idea here is the bomb infusion lifecycle is the complete bomb that everybody agrees on. And from there, ideally, this would go into another business system. It might be exported um, manually, like to Excel. Um, ideally, it would be integrated directly, which is something we can help with as well. But even if you have to spit it out to Excel, it's not necessarily completely disconnected. This export to Excel, it has this specific view, but notice this column, it has links back to PLM. So if I want to look, if I've if I'm a, a PLM user and I get this as a spreadsheet and I want to take get more information about this component, all I have to do is click here and it will actually open that part up in Fusion Lifecycle. Right. So even that export isn't necessarily disconnected from the system. Okay, so um, again, that was short, but I wanted to just give you a taste of it. Um, to give you a sense of the kind of things you can do. Um, but again, to review, the bill of materials really is the recipe for what it is you're creating. Um, at the beginning of the process, we're talking about the engineering bomb. Everything you check into the vault becomes part of your structured, up-to-date engineering bill of materials. And Vault PLM together allows you to easily hand that bill of materials off to other parts of the company where in Fusion Lifecycle and the PLM solution, the complete bomb lives, where everyone agrees on what that complete bomb is. Um, and that automated handshake, both from Vault to PLM and from PLM to other systems through integration, can take away that manual effort of retyping data from drawings, um, duplicate data entry to improve productivity, and more importantly, reduce mistakes that can be very expensive. All right, so thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I don't know where the time went. <laughs> um, I just love talking about this stuff. So um, if you've got questions, uh, please feel free to ask um, and I'll do my best to answer them. All right. So here's a question. Um, if I edit, say we're capturing vendor data in Vault um, in an item-based setup. Um, if I edit those properties in Fusion, will the information be updated in Vault 2? Um, that absolutely can happen. So what I showed you was sort of a one-way push, but that integration can absolutely be bi-directional. So what it comes down to is who owns the information and where is that information needed? So if it's information 
that engineering is responsible for. And engineering's primary tool is CAD and Vault. You would store that information for sure on the Vault items, and engineering would be responsible for maintaining it. So if that needs to change, you know, that might get triggered in Fusion Lifecycle for an overall review process, but ultimately the item gets revised in Vault, engineering makes those changes, they release the changes, and then those changes get automatically pushed to Fusion Lifecycle. So that would be for information that engineering owns. If it's information that somebody outside of engineering owns where they don't use CAD and maybe they don't even use Vault at all, that information would still be in, in Fusion Lifecycle because it's important for everybody to know, but ownership of that information could be in Fusion Lifecycle. That's where you go to edit it. That's where it's managed via change. And then when, so, when that change process happens in Fusion Lifecycle, um, that information um, can get pushed down into Vault. And in fact, um, it's going to my personal Yahoo email now, but I actually have something set up on my, uh, on my Fusion Lifecycle client um, just as a test where every time an item changes, in my Fusion Lifecycle tenant, um, I get an email with the new properties of that item. So through that mechanism, um, through integration, we can actually go both directions if we need to. So if the owner of the information is outside of CAD, outside of engineering, they could actually come into Fusion Lifecycle, maintain that information, and then if it's useful and important for that information to be visible in Vault, because not all of this stuff is necessarily important in Vault, but the information that is important can get pushed back down into Vault, right? So it can be bidirectional. So the short version of that is, yes, the system that the author and owner of that information uses should own it, and then other systems should get updated with it, and that can happen regardless of the system involved. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, so we'll give it maybe just another 30 seconds because that was a rather long-winded answer as I tend to give. Um, so we'll give it maybe just another 30 seconds, and then if nothing else comes in, then we'll close it up. Okay, so another question. So manufacturing can add items to a bomb that engineering releases to Fusion Lifecycle and hence create a manufacturing bomb, even if the item was released in Vault to engineering released. Um, absolutely. Yeah, and that is one of the primary purposes. And I guess I kind of went through it pretty quickly, but ultimately, if we're looking at something's bill of materials, notice there is an add button. I can add components to this bill of materials right here inside Fusion Lifecycle, right? So... And again, we can search and sort and filter to find exactly the component we need. So that bill of materials can be modified in Fusion Lifecycle. Now, if for whatever reason you need to see that in Vault, you could absolutely integrate the two to update the Vault bill of materials if you needed to. Um, but again, that comes down to, do you really want and need that information in the Vault? But absolutely, this bill of materials can be modified so I'm really glad you asked that question because it really should be clear. You have control over this bomb. Now, ultimately, the parts of the bomb that the CAD model owns, you can manipulate the bomb to your heart's content here. But depending on your integration, that manipulation may or may not hold, right? And again, that's all things you can configure as part of your integration. But in general, what the engineers own should largely stay static from a basic definition standpoint. Quantities and what's there, things like that, really should be owned by CAD. It's the extra things that you don't draw and that engineering may not even care about, like the packing tape that goes on the box that this thing ships in. Um, you still gotta buy that tape, um, it needs to be on the list, but engineering may not care. So that can live here in Fusion Lifecycle and not clutter up the vault.
Okay, so I haven't seen any other questions come in. So I think uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So again, thank you so much uh, for your time. And if you've got any other questions, feel free to reach out to me or uh, your Hagerman account uh, manager and uh, we can set up a one-on-one -on -one call to discuss. So Ashley, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Forrest, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, have a great day.